Well, as you might have guessed, I am not a video gamer, okay? I've never figured out how to get both of those thumbs to work at the same time in the way that uh, many of the younger generation seem so proficient at. When our boys graduated out of Atari and Frogger, uh, that was it for me. That was pretty much the end of my videoing, and I wasn't even all that good at that. So I like to think that I do my talking on the court, okay, on the field, uh, on the course. That's, that's where I like to show up, not the video gaming. I mean, anybody can do that, right? Well, no, not actually anybody. A lot of people can't. So I read with some interest this week, and I don't know if anybody's even heard of this game. I don't know if it's popular or not, but I came across an interesting statement about a video game called Pocket God. Pocket God. Here's the description. What kind of God would you be? Benevolent or vengeful? Play Pocket God and discover the answer. You are the all-powerful God that rules over the primitive islanders. And then it goes on to explain different scenarios in which you either are benevolent or you are vengeful and uh, take out your wrath on the people that you uh, have under your care. Well, I don't think you have to play pocket God. I don't think you have to play a video God to step into that world and that arena where we wonder sometimes about the works of God in our life and in our world. I think rather we do that pretty often, pretty regularly as we call out to God at various times, wondering what he is doing, why he's doing it the way he's doing it, why he's not doing it differently than the way he's doing it. And uh, those questions oftentimes surface as we think about ourselves and what God's doing maybe in our life and in the world that we live in. Very often the question is similar to the one the psalmist asked, Lord, how long are you gonna let these bad guys seemingly win the day? that becomes a common theme, doesn't it? Well, the psalmist in part answers that question when he says in Psalm 115, verse three, our God is in the heavens and he does whatever it pleases him to do. Our God is in the heavens and he does all the things that he desires to do. Well, we are at the beginning of a short series this summer on the minor prophets and we're going to be in the book of Nahum this morning. And in this little book, what I'd like for us to see is that God has the sovereign right to judge both individuals and nations. He is a God of both mercy and he is a God of wrath. He is righteous in all that he does. Let's jump in with a quick review. Uh, some of you were here last week, some of you weren't, so let's catch up together. We introduced the whole idea of the minor prophets, and so I want to bring back to you this morning three numbers that help you understand and navigate your way through the Old Testament. Those three numbers are 39, 17, 5, and 17. And I know it looks like there's four numbers up there, but one of them are repeating, so I'm going to go with three, all right? So we have 39. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. We have 17 books that form what is really the historical timeline that take us from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament history. In that 17 book stretch, you then plug in five books of wisdom and poetry, and you plug in 17 books of prophecy. And that pretty much gives you the whole Old Testament. 39, 17, 5, 17. And that gives you an ability to navigate. The second thing we talked about last week was two key terms to help you understand a little bit better what's going on in the Old Testament. I don't think you can figure out the Old Testament if you don't know these terms and, and, and how it is that God's relating to his people. The first one, remember, was the word theocracy. And theocracy simply is talking about God's rule over his people. God's intent and heart was to enter into a unique relationship with the nation of Israel, unlike any other nation. And he was going to be their God, theocracy. The God was going to be their king. He was going to rule over them. So that was a huge part of God's plan in calling Abraham and the nation of Israel to be his light and witness to the world. He was going to be their God. In that arrangement, God entered into a number of covenants with his people, the one that dominates the Old Testament is called the Old Covenant or the Mosaic Covenant. It was entered into with Moses at Mount Sinai. And within that covenant agreement, God said he would do certain things for his people if they would in fact obey him. 
And of course, he also said he would do certain things to his people if they disobeyed him. So you have in the Mosaic Covenant this agreement between God and the people of Israel. And we read some of those verses last week. You can go back to Deuteronomy 28. And in Deuteronomy 28, you have a wonderful summary of the whole Old Covenant, the whole Mosaic Covenant. And God spells out very clearly and very precisely, if you obey me, there is going to be blessing upon blessing in your life. If you disobey me, there are going to be untold heartaches and hardships in your life. And that's the story of the Old Testament. You are watching play out in the Old Testament scriptures that very reality of God in this relationship with his people, having entered into this covenant with them in which if you obey, I will bless. And if you disobey, then I am going to bring discipline your way. That introduces us to the third point of review, which is the prophets and the role of the prophets in this economy called a theocracy. And by the way, there isn't any other nation in the history of the world that is operating as a theocracy. There are those even in our country who talk about a theology of theocracy and they want to invite God to be in a theocratic relationship with America. And that's just not the way the Bible lays out the plan. So it was for Israel and Israel alone. God raises up the prophets then to do what? The prophets are those who bring the word of God to the people of God. We said the priest is the one who takes the people's concerns to God. The prophet flows back the other way, and the prophet flows from God to the people. They say a lot more about the present than they do the future. You see, when we hear the word prophet, we almost always think, what's going to happen? The prophet's going to tell us the future, and that's true. There are those kinds of statements. But many of the prophets speak as much or more about the present And this relationship with God and this agreement that they have entered into and what they do in that relationship is very often to say, you need to do this or else. You need to obey or else. You need to repent and turn from your sin of idolatry or whatever else it was or else. And you know what the or else ends up being? The or else ends up being in 722, the the nation of Assyria comes and takes away the 10 northern tribes of Israel. And they take them into captivity, and they never return. They never come back. That was the or else. God faithfully bore witness to his people through the prophets. This is what's going to happen if you don't. The same thing happens in 586. The two southern tribes of Judah are taken off into captivity into Babylon because they did not follow through on the or else. God is faithful to his word, both to obey, uh, both to bless when we obey, both to discipline when we disobey. That brings us this morning then to the goodness and the severity of God. The goodness and severity of God, and it's found in our study this morning in the little book of Nahum. So let's all take a moment, look up the table of contents, find the page on which the book of Nahum appears in your Bible, and uh, let's jump in there together, and you can find that pretty easily in the Bible in front of you on the, in the pew. Let's start with the background to this little book, this little letter, this little prophecy of Nahum. And the first thing I would say to us is welcome back to Nineveh. Welcome back to Nineveh. If you've been with us for a period of a few weeks or months, you know that we finished up just previously a study in the book of Jonah. And Jonah was God's prophet to Nineveh. He went to Nineveh as a prophet of God, and he spoke to the people of Nineveh. Nahum doesn't go to Nineveh himself, but he takes us to Nineveh in the sense that what he is going to do is speak about what God is going to do to the people of Nineveh and of Assyria. Jonah and Nahum literally go together. In your Hebrew Bible, if you had a Hebrew Bible in front of you, they literally go together. There's no Micah stuck in between uh, Jonah and Nahum. We have Jonah, Micah, Nahum. In the Hebrew Bible, they're just back to back. And they're back to back because they belong together. And they belong together because what God is doing in Nineveh in the time of Jonah has a direct correlation to what is going to happen as we're going to see in the time of Nahum. If you look on the map, you see that Nineveh is in Assyria, which is the north and east of Israel. And it is this kingdom of Assyria that in this time frame of Jonah and of Nahum uh, is dominating the world scene. 
And uh, that's why this is so important. Jonah shows us the mercy of God. Nahum is going to show us the wrath of God. And God displays both of these. These two little books both end the same way. They're the only books in the Bible that end this way. If you look at the book of Jonah, the last verse of the book of Jonah says, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? It ends with a rhetorical question. Of course, God, you should care about the people of Nineveh. Then you come to the little book of Nahum, the last verse of Nahum. There is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. It's talking about the Assyrians. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. That was a snapshot of the people and of the country, the, the kingdom of Assyria. So let's go from welcoming you to Nineveh to fast-forwarding 100 years. All right, so we fast-forward 100 years from Jonah, and we come to Nahum. Let's look at Nahum, very first verse of uh, Nahum's prophecy, an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. Three things as we look at the background. Who are we looking at here? Who is this guy, Nahum? This is all we know about him, right here. Nahum 1.1 is all we know. It's all we have. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, everything that we know about Nahum is right here. His name, Nahum, means comforter. His name means consoler, consolation. And we notice that he is from Elkosh. And we ask, where is Elkosh? And the answer back is, we don't know where Elkosh is. There's a debate about where Elkosh is. Some people think it's Capernaum. Capernaum, city of Nahum. And that may be the case. Uh, there were a lot of people called Nahum at that time, so that doesn't necessarily mean it was a reference to him. He has a vision, he tells us in verse 1. Most often when prophets received a word from God, they got it either in the form of a vision or of a dream. And a vision generally spoke to the fact that they were awake when they heard the word of God come to them. In a dream, they were obviously asleep. So Nahum receives a vision from God. When does this happen then? Because it's important to see this in relation to Jonah so we understand the time frame. And so we're about 100 plus years after Jonah and his ministry to the people of Nineveh. Jonah was in about 760 B.C., so in the 8th century. Nahum is in the 7th century, about 660, somewhere in there. We, we don't read of any king being mentioned in the book of Nahum. And that's important because we use those markers historically to say, okay, we know when that guy reigned, so that tells us kind of the date of the book. Nahum doesn't do that, but what he does do is this. He tells us that the city of Thebes is going to be destroyed or was destroyed, and so we know that happened in 663. So that marker we could put down. He's prophesying about the coming destruction of Nineveh. That happens in 612. So we just go, okay. We don't know exactly when this happened, but somewhere between 663, which is history, and 612, which is the fall of Nineveh, Nahum is doing this work of prophecy. Israel, the 10 tribes, remember, just to set historically where we are again. The 10 tribes of the north have been carried off in 722 by these Assyrians. So they're gone. Nahum is aware, aware of that historical reality. The 10 kingdoms of the north are gone. We know that in 586, as we said, that's going to happen to the two southern tribes of Judah. But in this in-between time, do you remember that amazing story in 2 Kings 18 when, when King Hezekiah was the king of, of Judah and Sennacherib came with the Assyrian army, a, a, a huge uh, army? And, and remember, Hezekiah calls out to God and he prays. And what happens? God miraculously intervenes and saves Judah. And 185,000 of the Assyrian army is wiped out by the angel of the Lord. And Hezekiah, of course, thanks God for that. Well, that's already happened. Now we have a guy named Manasseh on the throne of Judah. Manasseh is a puppet king of the king of, of Assyria. So that's Nahum's time. That's the world that he's living in. A lot of things have happened to the nation of Israel and to the people of God. What is then Nahum going to be talking about? 
Primarily, Nahum's message is about the fall of Nineveh. So if Jonah is about reprieve and about repentance and about mercy, then Nahum is going to be just the opposite of that. It's going to be about the rejection of God's truth by the people of Nineveh. It is going to be a message of doom in reality. It is going to be not the mercy of God extended any longer. It's now going to be the wrath of God that we read about in the book of Nahum. Within 20 years of Nahum's prophecy, the army of the Babylonians and the Medes comes against the city of Nineveh, and the city is destroyed. What could not have been imagined when Nahum was giving this prophecy happened. In fact, so dominant, so extensive was the destruction of Nineveh so accurate in its detail that those who do not believe the Bible is the word of God, therefore do not believe in prophecy, that there is a God who is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases, that there is a God who knows the beginning and the end. They read this book and they say this couldn't possibly have happened when it did. It had to happen after 612. He's writing history. It's too accurate. But of course we know that just speaks, doesn't it, to the work of God. The whole point, however, is this. Nahum is not going to Nineveh with this message. Nahum is not a prophet to Assyria like Jonah was. Nahum means what? Comforter, consoler. He is the man of consolation. Who's he consoling? Who's he comforting? He's comforting the people of God, Judah, those two southern tribes that are really under the oppressive rule of Assyria. And their heart is crying out to God and saying, God, how long is this going to go on? God, do you know that we as your people, we're suffering under the oppression of the Assyrians. These guys that are bad people are are, are wreaking havoc all over the world and on us. And so their heart is to cry out to God, when is there going to be any justice? It's a snapshot of Psalm 73, right? Right? If you're familiar with Psalm 73, the psalmist there is calling out to God and saying, God, how come these bad guys always seem to be getting the good stuff? And why is it that the good people, the people who are trying the hardest, are are seemingly getting the short end of the deal? And that was the cry of the psalmist. It's my cry at times. Isn't it yours too? You look around our world and you see the evil in our world. You see the brokenness of our world. You see the perpetrators of of evil things seemingly go free. And we wonder, God, how long? Well, of course, the Bible answers that question, doesn't it? Ultimately, it answers it. But here are the people of God. As we have those questions today, so they did. Ultimately, it comes down to what? It comes down to this simple question. Who is in charge? Who is in charge? And I think... In, in some sense, all of the minor prophets are answering that question. But certainly Nahum does. And so let's take a brief look at this little book of Nahum. There are three chapters here. We're obviously not going to go verse by verse. We're going to fly over, and then we're going to end uh, looking at a particular area of doctrine with regard to the character of God. But let's start off with what Nahum does by bringing to us the character of the judge. And of course, that judge is God. And I want to begin by reading the opening eight verses. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The the bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Now, 
Nahum shows us four different things about the character of God. Let's look at those briefly. First, he says, God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. He is jealous for his glory. He is jealous for his name. He is jealous for his worship. Exodus 34, 14, God says, he is a jealous God. Rightfully so, he is God. He is alone to be worshiped and and, and uh, trusted and glorified. God is especially jealous of his covenant people. He is especially jealous of you and of me as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ because he does not want anything or any other allegiances to creep into our life and to take the place that is reserved for him alone. So he just tells us, I am a God who is jealous, not in the way we are, oftentimes petty, and, and, and over insignificant things. No, God is jealous in a righteous way. Secondly, God is avenging. Look again at verses 2 and 3. The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. You just read these verses, and God is making the point as clear as he can make it. In fact, as you read those verses, you see that five times in verses 1 through 3, he speaks about Jehovah. He speaks about Yahweh. He speaks about the covenant God of Israel. Whenever you see in your Bible the word Lord and it's in large caps, it's using the word Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord. And it is that Lord who established himself as the theocratic king of Israel. It's that Lord who has entered into this relationship with his people, Israel, and he has committed himself to them for certain things as they follow and obey him. And so here is this one who is holy, and he is righteous, and he is avenging. In that, he also says he is slow, doesn't he? He is slow to anger. He is not quick to judge. He is slow to anger. We're going to pick this up at the end of our morning, so we're going to move on to the fact that God is sovereign. And you see that specified in verses 4 and 5. He rebukes the sea, and he makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Uh, Bashan and Carmel withered, the bloom of Lebanon withers, the mountains quake before him, the hills melt, the earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. Like many in history, the Assyrians worshipped nature. They had all kinds of gods to the various ways that nature expressed itself, as do many people in history and as do many people, frankly, today just in a more modern, sophisticated way, right? We, we basically, in, many, in, many, in the minds of many, worship nature. And we have removed God as the creator of everything, and so naturally in his place come all of these other things to which we bow and give allegiance when our worldview is to not see the fact that God is in the heavens, he does whatever he wills. But that's Nahum's point. The Lord is sovereign, and God is the one who does according to his will. Then lastly, he says, God is good. The Lord is good, verse 7, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. You see how Nahum is fulfilling his very name? He's a consoler. He's a comforter. He's bringing a word of consolation to the people of God, and he's saying to them, you know, in the midst of the storm, God is your stronghold. And so you can be absolutely sure that, that he has a stronghold on you. All right? You are in the grip of his grace this morning. We sang about it. You are in the grip of his grace this morning. He is a stronghold, and yes, he has a stronghold of you as his child. So Nahum starts with the character of God. And then when you go into chapters 2 and 3, first of all in chapter 2, you see the judgment described. The judgment described in chapter 2, and, and you note two things on your outline. You have the siege and the capture of the city, and you have the city just being plundered. The, the unimaginable happened to Nineveh. I mean, remember, Assyria, while there were signs along the way that they were losing some of their power, they were still the most dominant, powerful kingdom at that time, ruling the world around them with great ferocity and great fear. And here is Nahum, 
speaking before these things ever happen. And he is consoling the people of God and saying, you know what, it looks like the bad guys just consistently get away with everything, but you're forgetting that our God is in the heavens and he is a jealous God and he's an avenging God and he is a God of, of, of patience, but that patience is going to end at some point and God is going to do his work in the way that he describes. Look at, again at verse 8. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Look at chapter 2 and verse 6. The river gates are opened. The palace melts away. You know what happened? The Tigris River overflowed in such a way that it had probably never overflowed before. And the overflowing water of the Tigris River breached the wall of Nineveh. This, this massive fortress of a city that seemed absolutely impregnable from the outside. God who is sovereign, God who is over all of nature, causes the Tigris River to flood in an unprecedented way, and the floodwaters of the Tigris come up and undermine the wall of the city, and the city is open to be plundered. And the plundering of the city is, it was so thorough that as archaeologists have gone back and done their work in the city of Nineveh, which, remember, is in modern-day Iraq, right by the modern city of Mosul, which is in the news a lot. That's where Nineveh is. But when the archaeologists have been able to get in there, which they're not able to now, but when they've been able to get in there and do their work, you know what they have found? A great absence of any wealth. And you know what else they found? A lot of ash and debris. The city was plundered and burned to the ground. It is the judgment, he says in chapter 3, that they rightfully deserved. So he describes it in great detail, and then he, he tells us that they deserved it. And, and, and the reason they deserved it, he, he, he puts their sins before us and, and their, their great confidence in themselves. Nineveh was a proud and a prosperous people. And they became wealthy and they became dominant through obviously their military might and their great commerce. So much of their wealth was brought in through commerce, and, and, and rightfully so. But a whole lot of their wealth was by plunder and warfare and oppression. And so Nahum rehearses the things that, that the people of Nineveh and the kingdom of Assyria are guilty of. There is deceit. There is the plundering of, of war. There is oppression. There is violence, there is idolatry, there is demonic activity, all of these things mentioned by Nahum. They had experienced the mercy of God in an unprecedented way in the time of Jonah. A hundred years prior, they had responded to Jonah's message, and remember, even the king himself repented in sackcloth and ashes. But God doesn't have grandchildren. And so now generation after generation after generation has come on the scene, and they have, instead of obeying God, they have mocked God. And they have gone their way back to where they were before. They have ignored his warnings. The oppression of other people has extended to uh, wherever their reach would take them, and the cup of iniquity is full. That's what happens in the language of the Old Testament. When the cup of iniquity is full, God says, okay, it is time for justice. And history records from the vantage point of secular history a lot of reasons for the fall of Nineveh. And they are legitimate things that were happening to undermine the authority and power of Assyria. But do not mistake the one primary reason that Nineveh fell. Nineveh fell because God is an avenging God. God is a God who when the cup of iniquity is full, brings to bear all of the power of his righteousness and justice upon those who will not listen. So Nahum tells us what matters the most. He points us back to the God who is in the heavens, who does as he pleases. What I'd like to do to end our time this morning is to step a little bit out of Nahum, just from the standpoint of the context itself,
but carry the theme of Nahum over because the theme of Nahum is we have an avenging God. Jonah is the mercy of God. Nahum is the wrath of God. What do we know about the wrath of God? To say the wrath of God has fallen on hard times is obviously to state the obvious, isn't it? It simply upsets our modern sensibilities to talk about a God of wrath. We are far too sophisticated in our worldview to have any tolerance for an intolerant God. And so we will shape God the way we are comfortable in Him appearing, and we will shape God after the manner of our likeness. And that's basically the world that we live in today. We live in a world that does not want to know about, that does not believe in, that does not want to hear about the wrath of God. Arthur Pink wrote years ago, said this, It is sad indeed to find so many professing Christians who appear to regard the wrath of God as something for which they need to make an apology or at least to wish there was no such thing. They deem it unworthy of God. So, so what do we do? What do we do with the doctrine of the wrath of God? Well, one of the things that we do is, not we necessarily as the people of covenant, but one of the things that we do is we just deny it altogether, right? We, we have whole denominations in the United States of America that would never countenance the teaching of the doctrine of the wrath of God. Not only would they not have anybody step in the pulpit to teach it, the people in the pew would not hear it. So we have generations of Christians, in the broadest sense of that word, who have no understanding of this doctrine from a biblical vantage point. All they have are the caricatures and the false ideas about what that supposedly is. So we have those who just deny it altogether and they simply focus on the love of God. I mean, it's much more comforting, isn't it, to talk about the love of God? Maybe you're here for the first time this morning, and you're like, geez, the wrath of God, our first visit. Well, we like to hear about the love of God, don't we? We're, it's, it's far more encouraging to hear about the love of God on that level. The other thing that people often do is they conveniently say, well, you know what we're dealing with here is, of course, the Old Testament God. And the Old Testament God, yeah, boy, you got that right. You just read the Old Testament. He is a God of wrath. He is a vengeful God. He is a jealous God. But thank goodness, when we get to the Gospels, Jesus appears, and Jesus softens the whole view of God, and Jesus tells us the way God really is today. And so that other stuff is archaic. It's old. That's why we call it the Old Testament. We don't really need to go back there a lot because God today is as he is in Jesus, and we know what Jesus is. Well, Jesus is a God of love. And so many people solve the problem, if you will, or the, the issues that way. And they just simply say, well, that's the Old Testament God. But the truth is, my friend, if you read your New Testament with understanding, you will find a remarkable amount of teaching on the wrath of God and the judgment of God. What, after all, is the whole story of the New Testament if it is not God sending His Son to deliver us from the very penalty of God under which we find ourselves and rescue us on the cross. It is in Jesus' own words that we find more about the wrath of God, about the eternal punishment of separation from God than we do from anybody else in the New Testament. It is not fair to say that the New Testament God is all a God of grace and love, and the Old Testament God is mean and avenging. The truth of the matter is the God of the Old Testament is filled with grace and mercy and patience and compassion. And just as the New Testament depiction of Jesus is oftentimes words that take us back in the way he spoke to the people of his day. So we look at these things and we realize that Jesus is not only our Savior, but Jesus makes it very clear he ultimately is our judge as well. And he says that the Father has entrusted to the Son the very work of judging 
those who do not believe. We read in John chapter 5 and verse 22, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That, my, fr my friends, is the New Testament understanding of the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let's look at this doctrine of the wrath of God. What do we know about the wrath of God? Five things, and then we will have the wonderful opportunity of celebrating together in communion. First of all, God's wrath is always just. God's wrath is always just because God's wrath is always judicial. And by that, we simply mean God is as a judge administering justice. But in this case, the judge is absolutely perfect. The judge is absolutely righteous. He can do no injustice. He only gives what is deserved. So that when you look at Nahum chapter 1 and verse 11, from you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. You look at chapter 3 verse 1, woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. J.I. Packer put it this way, God's wrath is never capricious, it is never self-indulgent, it is never irritable or morally ignoble, thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. Remember what we read a few weeks ago, Genesis 18, 25? Shall not the God of all the earth do right? He was talking about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. God is a righteous God. Every judgment that God imposes and carry out, he does out of his absolute perfection of righteousness and justice. Secondly, God's wrath comes after remarkable patience. It's whatever men choose for themselves. I mean, that's what we have in these two books, right? Jonah and Nahum. In Jonah, they chose repentance, and God extended grace and mercy. In Nahum, they turned away, and God said, the cup of iniquity is now full. It's the very same thing that we read in the words of Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse 18, right, after the most familiar verse maybe in all the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You drop down to verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. So what is it that God does in carrying out his justice? What is the wrath of God? It is, in fact, chosen by those who reject God. Romans chapter 1, Paul says more about the wrath of God in Romans and the first three chapters of Romans than all of the rest of the New Testament authors put together. And what does he say in Romans 1? For the wrath of God has appeared. Why has it appeared? It has appeared because people turn away from the truth and they turn away from the light, just as Jesus said in John 3. What happens when the light shines and people prefer darkness? The justice of God will ultimately prevail. What happens when the truth is presented and people turn from the truth because they enjoy that which is false? The justice of God will ultimately come and it is that which is deserved. So the judgment comes upon people who have rejected the truth and rejected the light. Notice thirdly, God's wrath is to be feared. God's wrath is to be feared. Go back again to, to Nahum and you look in chapter one and verse nine. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. Nineveh is wiped out. There's no way to come back. Look at chapter 2 of Nahum in verse 13. Behold, I am against you. Those are sobering words, my friend. When the sovereign God of the heavens states, Behold, I am against you. Hebrews 10, 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So Jonathan Edwards, 1741 in New England, does what? 
he preaches a message which he had preached before. It's a message that's probably the most well-known message in American religious history. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. He preached that message as Jonathan Edwards always did by looking down at his notes and reading verbatim off of the page that he had written his messages on. But God used that message to stir the hearts of people and there was a great outcry and a great spirit of repentance because people realized that they were in the hands of an angry God if they were apart from Christ. Fourthly, God's wrath is his love in action against sin. What is the wrath of God? We dare not think of the attributes of the perfections of God as things that we can add and take away or that or God just adds these on as, as, as parts of who he is. No. The wrath of God, the, the, the love of God, the grace of God, the justice of God, the truth of God, all of these are interwoven into the very person of God so that in reality, the justice of God and the righteousness of God and the wrath of God is simply an expression of the love of God. It's not hard to understand. How, how loving is it for a parent to watch a child run into the street and not say a word? We, we wouldn't call that love. We might very well call that hate. What, what is it that would, that would be in your heart if you see your best friend making choices, clearly taking them away from God, and you don't say a word about it? How, how can a church function as a family under the command of the Scripture and have a church member step away from their, their walk with God and their commitment to the gospel and remain silent? Well, you can't, not, not if you love each other. So in reality, what, what is the love of God? Ultimately, it is expressed in the justice of God and in the hatred that God has for sin. You know, one of the many blessings of meditating on the wrath of God is the increased weightiness of sin that strikes our heart and our mind. When we realize what sin is in God's eyes, our appreciation for the justice of God and the judgment of God against that evil increases. Would a God who did not react against evil and sin be morally perfect? Would a God who had no, next time you're in a conversation with a friend and they're all about the love of God, they don't want to have any countenance of the idea of, of, the, of the wrath of God. Simply ask the question, do you really believe that a God who did not react against evil and sin would be morally perfect and worthy of your worship? And then lastly, God's wrath is satisfied in Christ on the cross. This is the ultimate expression of the gospel, isn't it? The wrath of God poured out on Jesus. That's why we have in 1 John the, the, the truth of propitiation. Propitiation is the idea that the wrath of God was poured out on the cross. It was poured out on Christ. It was Jesus who bore our sin. And the very thought that Jesus had of becoming the propitiation for sin caused even Jesus in his humanity to shrink back in the garden from the cross, didn't it? The terror of the thought of the wrath of God being poured out on him in that moment of time caused our Lord to say one more time to the Father, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What is the cup? The cup is the full expression of the wrath of God once and for all against sin. All of the sin of the world poured out on Christ. That's why we have the good news of the gospel 
because Jesus bore that. When Jesus died physically, he had already died spiritually. He had already experienced separation from God in time. And he knew the horror of what that was because he experienced the full expression of a righteous, holy God. And he did that because he loves you, because he loves me. There is an old hymn by William Rees that says, Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. You know what that is? That's Psalm 8510. It is Psalm 8510 that speaks of this matter of peace and perfect justice, kissing. And what is that? That's the cross. So what do we, what do we take away from the book of Nahum dealing with the justice and the wrath of God? I would suggest this. As Christ followers, we are to be full of grace and truth. We must live and proclaim both the judgment of God for sin and the grace of God that comes to us in Christ. My friend, that, that's, that's the gospel. The gospel isn't simply God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That may be a, a, a connecting point, but you can't stop with just good news. It's not enough to go into all the world and smile. We have to go into all of the world with the full expression of the gospel. And that gospel says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That gospel says that the wages of sin is death. The gospel says that all of us are dead in our sins and trespasses before God. It is the good news of the gospel that says that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. We have to take to the world not just a message of the love of God. We have to take to the world the hard truth of the wrath of God. The world doesn't even understand the course that it has chosen. I believe when Paul says in Romans 1, the wrath of God has appeared I believe we are living today as a nation and as a people under the wrath of God. We are clearly walking away from God at a pace that is hard to fully grasp. And God says, when you continue to make choices like that, there is the inexorable result of the wrath of God. And it is the cross of Christ that comes to us and says, there is a solution. There is an answer. Praise God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the glories of your grace. Thank you for the work of Christ for us on the cross. Thank you for the opportunity, Father, to worship you. Lord Jesus, to thank you. Holy Spirit, that you have opened our eyes to the understanding of the gospel of your grace. We thank you for all of these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.